Good uh, afternoon. Oh, sorry. I was here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Elena Crete with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network here in New York. And we have on the line here Michael Ginsberg, who is currently working on a chapter of our white paper on the research and development priorities for deep decarbonization in the United States. Uh, Michael is a PhD candidate at the Environmental Engineering School at Columbia University. Uh, and has been working on this topic for a couple of months now. And so Michael is going to walk us through his research to date and where the chapter stands, which we are hoping to publish in early 2020. And also just pose some questions along the way and some opportunities where he's looking for resources or collaborations with the SDSN USA network. Um, so without further ado, Michael, I'll turn it over to you and we can see your first slide. So please advance as you wish. Great. Well, thanks a lot for having me. And um, I'm sorry. Can you hear that in the background? Only a little bit, but we can still hear you fine. So just okay. Forget. Yeah. So thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'm really pleased to share my current the current state of my research on the research and development priorities for deep decarbonization. So this this chapter will examine enabling technologies for deep decarbonization. It's going to include technological roadmaps by group, um, as well as breakthroughs required and interactions and cost sensitivities between groups. In particular, it will look at the impact of research and development on timing and cost of deployment of technologies and show um, dependencies as well as a timeline by decade through 2050. In the first part of this chapter, the guiding questions are, what are the key technologies that will enable 100% decarbonization by 2050? And what are the R&D breakthroughs that are required? So this section will address the R&D implications by technology group, um, highlighting current bottlenecks and interactions, uh, such as cost sensitivities, land use, uh, sector coupling, and timing. This part will be primarily informed by expert elicitation as well as a uh, review of the research. Um, so these are the technology groups breaking down, broken down. We have electric vehicles, wind energy, solar photovoltaics, uh, carbon capture utilization and storage, geologic sequestration, biofeedstock, industrial sector, fuel cell vehicles, as well as a, a potential ninth category, which is behavior relating to demand response. So the primary data sources that are not expert elicitation come from the Evolved Energy Energy Pathways Report, uh, as well as the 2014 DDPP. So for the first group, electric vehicles, the research I've been conducting so far is tied to primarily the cost of batteries. Um, you can see here NREL's um, annual technology baseline uh, comes um, uh, is the primary data source. So the kinds of predictions that I'm looking for here are uh, dollars per kilowatt and, and future projections uh, based on based on um, based on both data as well as expert elicitation. For wind energy, I've collected some input from um, the expert elicitation. The current bottlenecks that I've observed are wind turbine component reliability. Um, the need to uh, increase the life of gearboxes and generators. And one of the ways that I want to demonstrate the technological phase and current relative market penetration of different technologies is through what's called an S-curve, uh, which shows the uh, group, the group, the technology, uh, the subcategories of technologies that are broken down by uh, startup, expansion, and mature. So for wind turbine technologies, um, the mature technology is geared drive, uh, expansion is direct drive, and startup is permanent magnet drive. And so the timeline so far that I've developed is in the 2020s, wind turbines with capacity over 10 megawatts will be common. The 2030s, rise of offshore wind farms, and 2040s, recycling and reuse of wind turbines will be especially critical. In addition, one of the uh, re results of the expert elicitation is a breakdown of the research needs by type of research. Um, so the questions that I've been posing are 
based on the type of funding needed by research type, how would it best be divided? So, um, so currently the, the findings are that basic research is 10%, whereas applied research, experiments and pilots and commercial demonstration comprise the uh, remainder at 30% each. Another important graph that I wanna include is the wind energy levelized cost of energy by level of investment. So pr these are predictions for um, what can we expect the price of wind energy to be considering um, differing levels of research and development in, uh, investment. So um, business as usual, today's R&D, you can see has the highest LCOE, whereas medium and high um, R&D result in a much lower levelized cost of energy. Similar for solar photovoltaics, I've broken down uh, into this S-curve where we have crystalline silicon as the primary um, technology comprising over 90%. Cadmium telluride and perhaps gallium arsenide are in the middle. And then perovskite solar cells are the current startup tech. Um, the bottlenecks currently are um, the need for a cost efficient grid integration, efficiency, stability, uh, and the need to in extend inverter life. And then the timeline so far is PV recycling in the US will be required in the 2020s. This is particularly important as uh, we see end of life uh, PVs, uh, PV modules near their end of life. Uh, 2030s, we can see an increase in efficiency above 30%, especially with tandem solar cells. And then into the 2040s, uh, renewable electrification of the chemical industry, as well as PV powered reverse osmosis desalination systems. So my current research in uh, CCUS, as well as direct air capture, uh, has identified that direct transformation of CO2 to useful products has a high energy requirement, which translates into a high cost. So it's, it's difficult to capture CO2 from um, point sources like flue gas and ambient air, as well as the need to better understand the life cycle Im uh, emissions impacts of CO2 capture and conversion. And the timeline, uh, in the 2020s, direct air capture um, at um, hundreds of metric tons of CO2 per year is likely. And then the cost uh, in the 2030s should fall to below $150 per ton of CO2. Um, and the 2040s currently um, is, uh, we're, we're working on that. Um, as well as the S-curve for the direct air capture, uh, we're seeing this is a very new technology with a lot of interest, but, um, there's a couple of, of uh, specific uh, <laughs> technologies that have been identified that, um, that I'm going to discuss in this section. Uh, similarly, the levelized cost of energy uh, translates into a uh, direct air capture cost uh, in dollars per tons of CO2 captured. Um, so that uh, has a similar relationship, whereas you go higher in the dollars uh, spent and lower in the tons of CO2 um, uh, cost. I'll also mention one more thing. The CCUS, the other uh, areas I'm looking at uh, include uh, not just direct air capture, but also um, uh, con capture from uh, the flue gas of power plants and, uh, and methanation through different materials. So geologic sequestration is an area where um, I'm research, my research is still ongoing and I need input from collaborators as well as um, literature recommendations. Um, similar for biofeedstock, this is just a graph from um, NREL's ATB, Annual Technology Baseline. And I, I'd like to create the same kind of metrics that I have for wind and solar for biofeedstock. So uh, also welcoming input here. The industrial sector, um, the, here we, we have a graph of uh, PEM electrolyzer for um, water splitting of um, uh, water splitting electrolysis. And this is actually an expert elicitation showing that increased R&D uh, results in lower capital cost of, of, uh, of the electrolyzer. Um, so I have, uh, I'm seeking additional input as well in the electrolyzer um, uh, in, in this area. Um, and fuel cell vehicles as well. Um, so welcoming collaboration here. So the behavior and demand side transformation is an area that, that I would like to include. 
um, but still thinking about how to, to be effectively do so. So once I have those specific areas fleshed out completely, um, what I want to ask in the second part is what is the cost of R&D and ROI for next-gen technologies uh, above the baseline 350 ppm compatible trajectory? So basically this will build on part one uh, by considering the reduction in cost of deployment of the technologies given these given breakthroughs have occurred. So um, the, the cost of deploying currently available technologies is shown in the Energy Pathways report. In the next slide, I'll show you. But what I would like to do is to project the reduction in cost as a percentage of GDP given achievement of the breakthroughs discussed in part one. So this is the graph that's shown in the, in the report. Um, and I like how it's displayed the specific um, uh, net energy system costs as well as as a percentage of GDP. And what I would like to show is the reduction in um, these costs given technological breakthroughs so that the invest, so we can see the, the, the ROI on the investment. And then finally, um, just I will succinctly end the chapter with the key findings from parts one and two, as well as a overall uh, timeline or critical path to deep decarbonization that shows the dependencies um, between technology groups uh, by decade. So again, I wanna uh, emphasize that these are the areas that I'm currently engaged in research on, and I'm welcome, I welcome in particular input from the uh, research teams at various universities who uh, would like to share either reports or their, um, or their expert insights. And to that effect, I have created a survey, which you can see at the link here. Uh, you can also take a screenshot of, the, um, of this uh, uh, code, and, or you could also contact me via email or, or at my number. So thank you very much, and um, well, looking forward to everyone's feedback. Thank you, Michael. Um, this has definitely taken a much clearer shape since the last time we talked and since the summer. So congrats on that. I can see that you still have a lot of uh, research to do, but the progress on the wind and, and solar and other technology sections um, is impressive. Um, I do have a few questions that maybe I'll just start out with uh, just so that we have an answer on here. And then Caroline or Elena, if you have any, feel free. Two of my colleagues are with me here, Michael. Um, so one thing I just noticed, so throughout this chapter, we're really focusing on the comparison of cost as an enabling factor uh, to adoption. And one piece of feedback we've gotten in a few of our other studies is how to incorporate other aspects of sustainability. Um, to you know, promote or advocate for certain technologies. So I'm wondering if there are other ways to include issues of equity, adoption, and you know, positive externalities from you know, reduced emissions or greener energy sources um, in your analysis um, to kind of promote those a bit clearer. Um, yeah, that's a great that's a great point, and I think. In my initial, uh, in my initial draft and thinking, I, I intended to include more of a life cycle assessment type of description of the technologies, and I think that it would be it would be prudent to include perhaps a small summary of the primary uh, for each of those technological groups. I do think that's uh, that's an important uh, that's an important thing to include. But one of the things of uh, feedback I, I received um, from from the team with um, evolved energy was the, the life cycle assessment can be maybe, I don't want to say murky, but it could, it could be perhaps not the best way to effectively communicate to the audience that we, that we're, we're reaching towards. But I, as an environmental engineer myself, I agree with you that LCA is important to, to include. Absolutely. Um, and then another question just on your industrial sector part, um, you focus a lot on the electrolyzer. I'm wondering, if there are specific industrial sectors you're covering there. Um, and I'm thinking specifically kind of the technologies involved with uh, the process emissions from cement can be a very different technology than, you know, electrifying steel manufacturing per se. So just wondering what you're thinking. 
Yeah, thank you for that question. So in the initial the table here, um, so electro electrolysis I, I is one of the technologies, but I certainly um, am including additional um, additional technologies. And one of the key reports that I've well, there's two actually. The reports that I've been looking at are one by uh, Julio, Dr. Julio Friedman, um, um, as well as Colin McCormick. So those are both on industrial sector decarbonization um, through and also uh, high heat uh, de decarbonization of, of, of high heat applications. So yes, uh, it won't be just electrolysis. I'm looking at um, a, lot, a lot of other technologies there. Great. Yeah, in, and I know that a lot of a lot of organizations have been mentioning hydrogen lately, which we've talked about before, um, which would also be really interesting to understand where that stands and what are some of the challenges with bringing that to scale as well beyond just cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, for part three, I just have a thought or recommendation. So I think summarizing your recommendations and having very clear takeaways is always super helpful and beneficial. I would add to that as well and suggest potentially if it if it's clear and makes sense to um, mentioning specific stakeholders or leaders in these different spaces. So if I was a researcher who's obviously reading this chapter to get a taste of what are the R&D gaps and what are you know the current state of these various technologies, but now I'm very curious and I want to learn more, understanding which groups at which institutions are really kind of the best in class for these beyond you know a generic Google search is always really helpful. So if that could also accompany your recommendations, that would be great. Yeah, that's a good idea. And um, to clarify, are you referring to the stakeholders who people could go to for more information? Or... Yeah, not the, not the okay. implementers, the, the ones that not are the implementers. Or, or that are looking into this, given that all of this is really at the cutting edge currently. Right, right. Yeah, and one thing that one one thing that I was wondering for this section is in some in some papers there are specific there are recommendations that are specifically designed or directed at um, you know government agencies, for instance, like uh, this government agency should invest X millions of dollars. I don't know if we want it to be that prescriptive. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, it could be interesting. It's kind of a it's a, a moving target, right? Um, but even just a, a small a half page on that could be very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my only other point, my last point I wanted to mention too was, and I'm sure you're already doing this, but given that we do have a few other chapters in the white paper that are ongoing, I'm thinking specifically the geographic siting chapter by Grace could be a really good opportunity to align with her, at least thematically, to make sure these big scale transformations that you're looking into and their projection down the line what does that mean in practical terms and what are the consequences for citing? But that way your chapters can complement each other. So if you haven't already done so, definitely uh, reach out to her because I know this month specifically she is working on that. Great. Yeah, that's definitely um, uh, top, of, top of mind. Great. Ladies, any other questions? No. Nothing from yeah. me. All right, I think we are good, Michael. So thank you so much. Um, uh, as a quick reminder, uh, we're gonna be having another webinar in two weeks time on the 18th, right before the Christmas holiday, uh, where mm -hmm. we're gonna hear about um, from Aaron on the employment in a low carbon transition discussion, which also might be interesting for your topic, Michael. You have probably the most cross cutting um, theme here for the white paper. So it'd be really interesting to make sure we're tying in across those. Um, uh, so I welcome you to join it and anybody else that's listening to this webinar. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. I will definitely uh, plan to attend that. And I think it's important to, um, yeah, especially where this chapter is at the at the end of the white paper. I think it's important to tie in a lot of those, um, of those other points. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Michael, we'll follow up with an email to our network and make sure to copy you. And then we'll make sure also to share the survey that you put together so that we can solicit some online um, online input from our network. Great, thank you. All right, thank you so much. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.